Hi, it's Emily from Bite Size Vegan, and welcome to another Vegan Nugget. This Q&A session followed a speech that I gave at the Woodstock Fruit Festival in Diamond Point, New York. If you haven't seen the speech, it's linked up there in the sidebar, as well as in the video description below, and at the end of this video. I hope that you find this session helpful. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them. I haven't seen your site. I loved your, your talk. Can you comment on honey? My husband died and he made me, made me promise I would take his hives. Well, yeah, and, and I, do, I do have a video on honey, but I'm happy to talk to that, speak to that, because I think, again, that's another one of those issues that people don't always think of initially because I'm sure that you probably know more about bees than than most people but you know they create the honey to feed themselves and to feed their their babies uh, so when we when we're harvesting the honey we're basically taking their food and I your practice might be different in the in industrial honey industries they also will gas out their bees you know when it when it it just isn't economically viable to keep them over the winter haul they'll just kill the, the hive on mass and then just order new ones there's also the the ethical implication of shipping them where you know they get damaged and killed a lot of the times when the when people order queens and the queens come in the mail they they have their wings ripped off they have you know they they'll just be, be torn off and then they're, they're stuck in the hive it's still and, and and the funny i mean the thing is with all animal products there's there's ways yes to to farm honey more ethically than other ways in the end, we're still taking the food and the, the, the product of these bees who are making this not for us, um, and, and, it's, and it's always to their detriment. Um, additionally, there's the, the environmental aspect of it, um, and a lot of people, you always hear, if, if the bees die, we're not going to have any food, and that, that's true of the pollinator bees. Uh, the bees that we farm are actually really bad at pollinating, <laughs> effectively, um, and, and they, they will actually edge out the native bees that need to be going and populating and so are pollinating. And so it also becomes a bit of an issue of this, this false introduction of, of a species that doesn't naturally exist. Uh, so that can be detrimental as well. Um, but from the purely ethical side of it, just in, a, in as brief as I can be, it is you know, taking the food that they, they've created for themselves and their, and their, um, their offspring. As far as what to do with a colony that you already have, you know, that's, I could see that being a very difficult decision, especially when it's tied emotionally to your husband. And I can look into it and maybe help brainstorm because I also want to be respectful of the fact that it is tied to, you know, your husband, which complicates it emotionally. I was wondering, I have a cat and uh, the cat eats uh, organic uh, cat food and things like that. And I feel a little bad about it. Anything that you could recommend? Yes. Um, I, I do have, I have a really old video on on vegan pets and uh, I plan on doing one that's more recent that's particularly focused on cats because there's the concern of the obligate carnivore um, and dogs very easily can be vegan and and it can be very healthy um, my dog is vegan and has skyrocketed in her health uh, with cats it can be a little trickier the the interesting thing though is one of the main elements that makes them obligate carnivores is taurine. And the taurine that is in meat-based cat foods is the same synthetic taurine that's in vegan cat foods. So it's all synthetic. It's been synthetic since the early 1900s when they, like way before Red Bull, they created synthetic taurine. Um, and so it is possible for cats to be vegan. However, I say this with a caveat because there are cats that might have a pre-existing condition or can suffer uh, kidney issues depending on their their medical history. So it's something that needs to be done very delicately. If you're going to transition, um, it would need to be very, very, very slowly. And, and with keeping in mind, watching them, watching urinary patterns and such. So I, it, it, is, it is possible, but like I said, with a caveat, there are sometimes cats where it just, because of perhaps existing kidney issues, they can have a, a difficulty with that. That said, I do have like some uh, Amy's cat food is one, and, and again, I'll, I have these resources on my site, and you can email me, and I can send you. I'm good at sending links. Is one that I've heard good things about, um, and there are some others. There's also even like vegan tuna, you know, that you can use to kind of make it more appealing if if they're having trouble with transition because cats particularly don't like their food changed. And I'm, I'm not sure about your brand, but one of the things that is shocking more so about I mean, if you even sometimes it's less about for some people it's it's a little less about like oh I don't, you know feeding your animals meat is like the the type of meat that goes into cat food even some of the higher grade ones is 
Uh, most, most pet food companies have stopped most of the prominent ones have stopped putting in euthanized pets, but the, that was a big thing for a while. They, they, the dogs and cats that get euthanized, they are put into pet food, and there's even traces of the euthanasia drug within the pet food. Expired meat goes in there, and they're not legally, re- like anything from the supermarket that's gone off, uh, they're not legally required to take it out of the styrofoam plastic packaging first, so that gets ground up that's in there. Uh, flea collars go in there. Um, there's soap, oil, and lubricants have been found in pet food. Um, this is interesting. Reject meats that, okay, if you think of a hot dog, you know hot dogs are, are like the most rejected meat parts possible. The meat that the hot dog companies refuse to take goes to pet foods. So that's how bad it is. <laughs> like if, the, if, the, if, if, if like a hot dog company says, mm, you know, then you know that that's, it's not choice. Um, and yet the, <clears throat> the commercials are going to be like this, you know, like give your cat this filet mignon and it's not. It's really horrific stuff. And if you look at it, like, why is it that our pets are developing, like, cancer and, you know, kidney disease and these th- these diseases that, like, you don't see a wolf, like, oh, I got the cancer, you know. And obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's more than that. But it's like, you know, we're feeding them kind of the same processed issued foods that, that we have. Um, and it's just, it's really, it's, it's terrifically unhealthy when you look at what actually goes into the, the pet foods. And there's not great regulation um also the 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 spent animals that we saw like animals that are too diseased you know that have just collapsed and or are like severely diseased and have you know pustules and stuff that goes to pet food so it's like they're the rejects of the rejects and and so that can sometimes be even more concerning for some people than than the ethical side if you're not super ethically upset about feeding animals to your animal it's like thinking about what else is in there can be really concerning, so. Uh, so like, I know a lot of people that like raise their own chickens, you know? Mm-hmm. So like, other than like if any kind of crusty eggs, like is there anything like health-wise? Ooh, I'm gonna, I have a whole video plan for that. <laughs> I'm really excited about it, it's gonna be a good one. Can you repeat that question in a second? Oh, yes. He was wondering, um, people, some people raise their own chickens, and so outside of it being gross coming out of the, the one hole issue, is there an issue of, of health? I think primarily is what you're talking about. I know a lot of people ask about ethics, too. Like, if I'm raising my own chickens, is there an ethical issue here? So I'll speak to the ethics really briefly, and then I'll go to the health side, which is just there's so much goodness about eggs and health. On the ethics side, because I, I get this a lot with, like, well, if you raise our own chickens, you know, we're not doing anything rude to them. It's kind of similar to the bees, although bees, you know, they need their honey to eat. At the same time, like a chicken's egg is it's they're creating their eggs for themselves, not for us. And it's so on that very basic ethical level, it's still taking something that doesn't belong to us. Chickens will cannibalize their own eggs when they're unfertilized, and it's actually good for their own body and what they need, whereas it's like the opposite of what our bodies need, so it's best for us to just let them do that. And and a lot of people too, like who have backyard chickens what it's becoming a big like kind of hipster phenomenon i'm gonna get back your chickens you know it matches my beanie or whatever i'm not trying to be offensive to hipsters but um (laughs) it's like a thing now but i think people also don't it's it's kind of like the phenomenon of getting your child a chick for easter or a bunny for easter it's like it's like a fun cute and it sounds really great and then people don't realize the upkeep and the the entire cost of it and then so there's all these backyard chickens that are then people are like "Mm, what do we do with it oh we'll eat the chicken or we'll release them so there's all of those issues. Health-wise, eggs are probably one of like the worst things you can put in your body. There is a the, one of the longest-running uh, nutritional studies is the Harvard Nurses Study, where they they looked at you know this group of a large group of women. I think it was over a hundred thousand women, and over a period of more than fifteen years, and they were basically trying to study uh, what the leading causes of mortality were within within these women and just in general. And they found that eating one egg a day shortened your life the same amount as smoking five cigarettes a day. Mm-hmm. And and so it's it's very unhealthy. And interestingly enough, Dr. Greger of Michael uh, Michael Greger of nutritionfacts.org used the Freedom of Information Act and he was able to get these correspondences released from between the egg board and egg industries because in the United States at least, if you are an egg company and you want to make a commercial uh, and you want to use the government has a particular allotment of money for for the egg people. And if you want to use the government's money, you have to phrase things in a particular manner. You have to be truthful. Basically, you can't lie. Whereas if you want to make your own advertisement, you can say whatever you want. So there were all these emails between the USDA and these egg companies. And this is funny because this is coming from the USDA, who itself benefits from animal products being sold. And but even they are were regulating this. And there and it and it turns out legally. You can't call eggs healthy. You can't call them healthful. You can't call them nutritious. You cannot call them a good source of protein. 
Um, you can't call them part of a balanced diet because they're not any of these things legally. You cannot even call them safe legally. They can't be called safe because they're so phenomenally detrimental to health. They're, they're so high in cholesterol. They're so high in saturated fat. There's, you know, of course, you know, the E. coli and all of those issues as well. They're not even really high in protein. So what they had to do to kind of finagle it was like they, you couldn't even say that they helped with weight loss because they don't because they're high, they're giant cholesterol and fat. So what they had to say was that it was, it would help you stay full. It's, I think, what they went with. And it's like, oh, the food that helps you stay full. So, yeah, eggs are incredibly unhealthy. So even ethics aside, it's just probably one of the worst things you can put in your body, if, if that's helpful. Um, and I'm going to, I plan to do a whole, I'm excited about that video. It's going to be good. <laughs> It'll be better than what I just said, I hope. So. <laughs> so do you, like, speak about, or, uh, horseback riding? I have a video on that, which made people very angry. So, um, <laughs> it did. So it's on there. You can always, on, if, if you guys don't know already, you, on YouTube, there's like a search feature on every channel. So you can always search my website. I tried to make a search as full as possible, but if you ever get lost, let me know. Horseback riding, there's, there's a lot of issues, and I'm, I'm definitely not going to remember all the statistic, statistics properly, but even just the act of itself causes um, spinal displacement, you know, it causes spacing within the vertebra. And, and, and things like that. And that can happen even within 15 minutes of riding a horse. And, and so there's, there's lasting spinal damage. And especially with, I have a whole video on horse racing that is just beyond horrific. That pra the whole industry is, I could go on forever about that, that video probably was one of the most heart-wrenching I've made. But within that industry, but also some people who, who ride just in general, they will ride horses when they're when they're young and they're they're um, the plates have not fully fused you know yet in their bones and so uh, it's it's doing you know severe damage before their their bodies are even fully formed you know which can take you know I think it's like it's multiple years for horses before all the plates are are in place um, and bits alone I have I actually have a video all about bits is. Um, you know they they do these, these this huge damage on the rails of the because horses have they have the teeth and they have like a, a straight part where there's no teeth um, and it actually digs these grooves in there um, the bits are are digging into the roof of their mouth there, there's something called the trigem, trigeminal nerve which we all have and and it's it's the bits are designed to press against the trigeminal nerves as well as the halters so the reason you'll see horses like do this all the time is that they're reacting to this pain it's 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 hurting them. You'll hear people say there's gentle bits and there's, there's these kind of bits, but bits are meant to control the horses, and the way that we control the horses is through the pain. And the saddles, of course, and again, if someone is a, is, is, is a proper horse rider, they're not going to let their, their horse get to the point of having saddle sores, but that can become a huge issue um, as well, the, the wearing as well. But, um, but like the spinal displacement, no matter how gently you ride, is going to be a factor, like I said, even within like a 15-minute ride. And there are... There's, there's a lot of ways to interact with horses without sitting upon them um, and, and to interact and have, because, you know, like there are horses that need rescues and they need homes and there's ways to interact with them from the ground, uh, to exercise them from the ground as well. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting, again, that, you know, we feel that like, well, how is my horse going to exercise? Well, how does our dog? We don't have to ride our dog. Our dog to exercise, um, you know, and so it's, it's, again, it's kind of just like we have this, this just not a disconnect, but more of a blind spot because we grow up. You ride horses; that's what you do with the horse. That's that's why they're there. But physically, it is just it's very damaging for them, and I would argue emotionally as well. Like if, especially when they're all, you know, they have all the tack on them, and the and the bits are up in there. If you get into things like dressage and show, and then they have double bits, and they have all of these things on them, and then the horse racing industry, like I said, is. Is, is just heartbreaking. One thing I think that a lot of people don't, just like people don't know about the dairy industry, with the horse racing industry, they have a very similar setup where you have the purebred horses that are like, you know, the, the future, potential future race horses, and they need to be nursed, uh, but their mothers are gonna be, you know, used to kind of make more potential race horses. So what they do is they have these nurse mares, kind of like um, like wet nurses back in the day. So you have these, these wet nurse mares, they're called nurse mares, that um, they have babies, and those babies were like, oh, you're not a purebred, you're not going to become a racehorse, so they are sent to slaughter, just like the baby cows um, are. Although it's not legal in, in America to, you know, to, to slaughter horses, especially, so, and then it's not even legal to ship them to Canada at that age, which is what we do with older horses, we ship them to Canada to die or to be killed. 
So a lot of times the babies of um, the nurse mares are just, you know, clubbed to death or, or just killed very violently um, by the farmer. And then the purebred gets to nurse from that horse. So, and this industry is just pumping out thousands and thousands. And then they, you know, they usually have blowouts on the track and they literally, their legs break and it's, they're just thrown aside. So. People make these, these changes. On, on the topic, what do you do with you? Personally, yeah, personally, I tossed all of them um, because I didn't want it around anymore. But I say that with a caveat that I think, especially if, if you're in a place financially where you have a pair of work boots and that those work boots are leather, and if you don't have those work boots, you have no shoes. Wear your shoes. Like, wear your boots until they're done. You know, if you have one coat and if you don't have that, you're going to freeze to death, wear the coat. You know, the, the damage is done. The, the problem with it, of course, is that it can give the appearance to others that, that you, you think it's okay. It, it can confuse people that, like, oh, well, she's vegan and she's wearing this. But, again, I, I think, especially when people are new, like, considering your circumstances, do the very best you can. Personally, I got rid of it. I didn't want it around. I didn't want, it, I didn't want to be validating it in any manner. But I also will not condemn someone who needs to wear out their shoes because that's really, that's their pair of shoes and that's what they have. And then from now on, like now you know differently and you can act differently from, from here on out. You can make different choices. And I mean, this is something I say because I have a lot of people ask me like, why don't people get it? Or like, why don't people, with all of these facts that we have, all of this data that, that I just showed, like, what's the deal? Like, why aren't people grasping this um, when there's hard facts? And... You know, that can be, it can be really frustrating. And I think, honestly, and this is my personal opinion, so I don't have a study for this, but my personal opinion as to why people don't get it sooner and, and accept it or, or just never make that connection is that to go vegan, when you go vegan, especially if you're going vegan ethically, when you make that decision, you are simultaneously acknowledging what you've been contributing to in order to say I'm going to go vegan because I'm, I'm recognizing that this is what the animals are going through and this is what the plant is happening to the planet and that I'm taking food from starving children. That's not something we want to admit. It's not something that's happy, that's, that's easy to face. And I think because, like I said in this speech, we want to be good, thought of as good people, we don't want to be people who are doing those kind of things, I think a lot of times that's the greatest hindrance for people is that it is painful. Like when you go, when you go vegan with this full knowledge of all of the aspects, it is openly acknowledging that, like, I did these things. I was complicit in, the, in these atrocities. And I think it's a lot easier. So, so, number one, so I think that's probably the main reason, but that is never the reason you will hear when people are having objections about veganism. You're going to hear protein, you're going to hear, you know, like X, Y, or Z nutrient, you're going to hear, you know, well, we have canines because we're, because to even say that objection, they'd have to be in, in touch with all of those painful things. And I think it's just, it's, it's too much for a lot of people. It takes a lot of strength to look at that in the face and say, I did this, this is what I did. Um, so instead we get all of these other excuses that aren't based in any logic. Thank you so much for watching this Q&A. I hope that this session and the speech it followed were helpful. Please share this around to help reach others with similar questions. You can find the blog post for this Q&A and for the speech as well as a list of additional resources linked below and up in the sidebar. You can also search my website at bitesizevegan.com or my channel here on YouTube for topics that I've already covered, and always feel free to contact me with questions, though do know that I receive a lot of emails and I answer each one personally, so response time is slower than I would like. Please give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful, and if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you as a subscriber. Here at Bite Size Vegan, I post videos every Monday, Wednesday, and some Fridays, so do hit the subscribe button if you want more helpful vegan content. Thank you so much for your time. Now go live vegan, and I'll see you soon. To go vegan, when you go vegan, especially if you're going vegan ethically, when you make that decision, you are simultaneously acknowledging what you've been contributing to in order to say I'm going to go vegan because I'm, I'm recognizing that this is what the animals are going through and this is what the plant is happening to the planet and that I'm taking food from starving children. That's not something we want to admit.